phone, I'd just like to ask the telehealth sites to please mute your mic if you are in your telehealth room. Can you make sure that your mic is muted? Okay, excellent. Uh, so welcome to this year, uh, the 2018 WF Mitchell Bioethics Seminar. Uh, to get us started, I would like to ask Bruce Acton, the CEO of the St. Paul's Hospital Foundation, uh, to come forward and let us know a little bit more about our seminar Please welcome Bruce. Well, thank you very much. You know, St. Paul's Hospital Foundation is the fundraising body for, for our hospital. In, yeah, since 2006, investment earnings from the WF Mitchell Endowment have led our foundation and have supported this bioethics seminar. I, the, the endowment's named in memory of a local businessman. His name was William. Mitchell. He was better known as Bill. And uh, I want to take a moment to tell you about uh, a little bit about the man so you can get some sense of uh, why this, uh, this endowment exists. Um, he, he was a successful businessman in the city. He was the original franchise owner of the McDonald's restaurants here in Saskatoon. So as, as uh, a kid, I remember the uh, first McDonald's uh, restaurant opening in Saskatoon. And I have some memories of uh, Mr. Mr. Mitchell. He owned all of the, the uh, franchises in the city until his passing. Um, his wife, Joanne, in his memory, uh, made a donation to our hospital foundation and established uh, the endowment uh, in his name. And the reason that she did it is because he was well known for his high moral standards and his ethical practice in, in business. And he also had a strong interest in giving back to and so, uh, uh, so the WF Mitchell uh, uh, Annual Bioethics uh, Seminar at St. Paul's Hospital was, uh, was established to discuss topics uh, that were of importance to, uh, to St. Paul's Hospital's mission, vision, and values. And so I want to thank you for attending uh, this seminar, and I'm looking forward to enjoying uh, the speaker. So thanks for joining us. in neuroscience from Carleton University uh, before moving to Alberta for a, a, for a research fellowship at the University of Lethbridge. In 2007, she joined the Pallas Foundation to focus on mobilizing scientific knowledge into public policy and professional practice. Dr. Sharon's research is also a personal passion that she puts into action as the chair of the volunteer board of directors for Calgary Alpha House Society, which is a nonprofit charitable agency that provides safe and caring environments for individuals whose lives are affected by alcohol and other drug addictions, which I think is something that reaches on us at St. Paul's Hospital as well. Uh, this is Dr. Sharon's first time visiting Saskatchewan, and so when she came to the hospital this morning, I told her I wanted to make it a memorable experience, so I promptly accidentally took her down to the sub-basement uh, where we spilled her coffee on her. So I'm hoping that things go up from there. If any of you would like to do something to make Dr. Sharon's time here in Saskatchewan more memorable so she comes back, uh, see if you can do better than that. We'll see. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Dr. Sharon. Uh, thank you so much. I hope that uh, nobody wants to spill anything else on me, um, but feel free to do anything else that you would like. Um, so what I'm going to do for you this morning in the next hour is cover off a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, which is how experiences shape the developing brain over time in ways that either can set us up to do reasonably well in life or potentially set us up to, to struggle. We have many decades worth of information about how experiences change the brain. As a matter of fact, the first published report on this was in 1949 by a famous Canadian neuroscientist named Donald Hebb. Um, and he published a theory, essentially, um, of, about how experiences worked to change the developing brain. What he postulated is a theory that cells in developing brain circuits, when they fire together, they end up wiring together. So fire together, wire together, you guys might have heard that expression before. Um, but that is now known as Hebb's Law, and it's taught in every undergraduate neuroscience course that I know of. Um, so we have these many, many decades worth of information about how experiences change the brain that it's not actually getting out there into policy, into practice. And I 
I'm sure you've also probably heard a lot about this new neuroscience that people talk about. Well, that neuroscience isn't really new. Again, it's based on decades worth of animal research. What's newer is that we now have, over the past 15 to 20 years, um, our neuroimaging techniques are catching up and allowing us to peer into the human brain and see how all of the principles that we've already determined from mammalian research actually play out um, and, and also play out in that human brain. And I think the next stage of this information really is going to be how do we take this and use it in the best possible way in services for kids, for families, and for adults who are struggling uh, with some of the outcomes of those early negative experiences. So I'm going to walk you through about six principles of experience-based brain development. Then we're going to talk a little bit about what derails that development um, and some of the long-term outcomes associated associated with that, and then we're going to finish with a wrap of how we now think about building resilience in children as well as in families and adults. Now the 
area that's located here at the back of the cortex is actually the primary visual system. It's a complicated circuit, but compared to other circuits in the brain, it's reasonably simple. It's a sensory system, and it comes online very, very early in development. And the last area to mature is this area here behind the forehead and the eyes. It's called the prefrontal cortex, and it's the seat of our executive function. So some of the most complex functions that we have, which are supported by very complex circuitry. And I'll talk a little bit more about executive function in a few minutes. But again, you see that simple, more complex maturational process going on, those simple circuits supporting the development of more complex ones over time. <clears throat> now I have a different representation of that for you here. Um, what I have along the y-axis here is the number of connections or synapses that are being formed in specific neural circuits at a given point in time. And those three lines on the graph represent three neural circuits in the brain. Obviously, we have far more than three neural circuits, but they're illustrating a point here. And we've got age along the bottom, the prenatal period, the first year of life broken down by month, and then age going out to 19. And the takeaway here is that simple circuits, again, are wiring up first. So what you're seeing is a surge in synaptic connectivity um, in the circuits represented by this yellow line in the perinatal period. The yellow line represents sensory systems, those neural circuits. So they're fairly basic neural circuits, and they're very, very important for us to gather information about the world around us so that we can react in that world. We need those circuits to come online very, very early in development, and they do, right in that perinatal period. But we also know that they support the development of more complex circuits. So in this particular um, uh, diagram, what you have is the second circuit to emerge, represented by the blue line, is language. Um, language and communication. communication. We know that little babies need to hear spoken language to learn properly how to speak that language. So that communicative circuitry is really resting on the auditory inputs that it's receiving in that first year of life. And that's why people talk about the importance for early auditory testing in babies. If we don't know that a baby can't hear properly before those language circuits start to wire up, we can't potentially go in and intervene to keep those language circuits on their best developmental track. So we know that, um, <clears throat> that those language circuits um, very much rely on sensory systems. And then the last circuit, um, which is showing a rise in synaptic connectivity here, the last circuit to mature, represented by the red line, is called higher cognitive functions in this particular graph. But this would be um, behaviors like being able to pay attention, follow lots of rules, uh, able to navigate in complex social environments with our peers, with other uh, family members, and those very much rely on the circuits which have been built before. So they very much rely on our ability to communicate with others. We navigate in complex social environments. Without the ability to communicate, we can actually have a problem doing that. We need our sensory systems to be able to take in information about the world around us in order to make decisions about what we're going to do in that world. So you get a fault in any one of these earlier circuits, and you can potentially destabilize the circuits which are building on top. So again, keep that in mind throughout the entire presentation because it is a really, really foundational point in brain development. But the last thing I want to point out to you on this graph is this steep drop-off in synaptic connectivity in each one of these circuits that's occurring over time. What's going on here is we're not progressing as we get older in terms of these neural circuits. It turns out that more connections are not always better in neural circuits. There is a normal developmental process going on called pruning, whereby the brain creates speed and efficiency in neural circuits in order to, again, process information or perform whatever behavior or skill faster and more automatically over time. And that pruning process is important because it is experience dependent. It's the connections or the synapses that get used in each neural circuit the most, which are going to get nice and strong and sturdy and remain over the lifespan of that circuit. And the ones that don't get um, used very much, they're going to get weaker and weaker, and eventually they're going to get away. And essentially, what this is, is that what wires together 
Ireland wires together Hebb's Law that I was talking about previously, first published back in 1949. The connections that get used in the circuits are the ones that remain, the ones that don't get used get pruned away. So I have an image here of what this actually looks like in the human brain. So this is a very thin slice of the cortex of the human brain at three different ages. The first panel at three years, or sorry, at birth, the second panel at three years, and the last panel at 14 years. And all of the blob, blobby areas in each one of these panels are the bodies of cells, and all of the long lines coming off of them are axons and dendrites, the places where the cells make the most connections with other cells around them. <clears throat> so the more long lines, obviously, the more connections in this particular area of the brain. And so the takeaway, of course, is that at birth, in this particular area, there's almost no connections between the cells. This circuit is not yet wired up. By three years of age, there's been a huge explosion of connections. It's really a genetic signal that tells, tells cells when they should start reaching out and making connections, but they make those connections very exuberantly. They make all sorts of connections without a whole lot of you know, really specific planning. And then it's the use of the circuit which ends up dictating which of those connections remain and which get pruned away. And what you see here by 14 years is that probably 50 to 60% of those connections in that circuit are gone. But this is gonna be the more mature configuration of that circuit. Whatever behavior, whatever skill, uh, whatever piece of information that this circuit processes, it's gonna be faster and better at doing it at 14 years than it is at three years because many of those connections are gone, and the ones that are remaining are the ones that get used a lot. So what does this actually mean when we think about the environments that children grow up in? Well, I'll give you two extreme examples of different environments and how the experiences that those environments end up producing can shape the brain in different ways. So in the first scenario, imagine a child growing up in a stable two-parent family. There is access to high quality child care when the parents are out. Um, the child has lots of opportunity to get together and play with their peers on a regular basis. There is a safe playground down the street where the child goes and gets lots of physical activity. And when that child finally gets to school, the class sizes are all small and the teachers are able to pay a lot of individual attention to each child in their class. So that child is having a set of experiences which is essentially driving the pruning process in key ways. What behaviors and skills is that child getting to practice? Well, they're getting to practice forming strong attachment-based relationships with the adults around them. They are getting the opportunity to practice learning how to get along with their peers. They are likely practicing language and literacy a lot because they've got a lot of adults around them who are reading to them and talking to them on a regular basis, encouraging them to speak. They are likely practicing good emotional control because the child has access to a lot of adult support when they're upset. So this child is likely going to be set up well once they finally hit the school system, right? Likely set up to succeed reasonably well. Now imagine a child growing up in a different sort of scenario. There is substance abuse and domestic violence um, in the home. Um, when the parents are away, uh, they sometimes manage to get the neighbor down the hall to look after their child, but when they can't do that, they just leave their child home alone for long periods of time. No one is bothering to get that child together to play with their peers on a regular basis. There are no other kids around in the apartment building that they live in. Um, the playground down the street is full of gang activity and drug dealing, so it's not a safe place for kids to go. And when that child finally gets to the school system, the teachers are all really busy, and they can't spend a lot of individual time with each child in their class. So this child is having a different set of experiences, which is shaping that pruning process in different ways. <clears throat> so what sorts of skills and behaviors is this child getting to practice? Well, they are likely practicing a lot of behaviors involved in anger and aggression, because that's what they're seeing in their home. And that is what they're emulating um, when they see it in their parents. They are also likely practicing a lot of fear-based behaviors. Because guess what? It can be pretty scary when mommy and daddy are drunk and fighting all the time. 
but that's the only solution that you learn. Um, pretty soon, that does not become an adaptive way of handling, handling interpersonal conflict. You can't continually hide from conflict as you get older and you end up having conflicts with your spouse, or with a coworker, or with your boss, or another family member. And what if this child's not getting the opportunity to practice? Well, they are likely not getting the same opportunity to practice early language and literacy skills because not a lot of adults are around them, reading to them, and speaking to them on a regular basis. They are not getting the same opportunity to learn how to get along with their peers, learn that when you hit little Johnny, he might not like that, and he might not want to play with you. Um, you are likely not learning good emotional control because you don't have a lot of adult support when you're upset to teach you how to calm down. And not only that, you're probably also not learning how to form those trusting, attachment-based relationships with the adults around you. So once that child finally does get into the school system and can maybe find a supportive adult who can help them, they might not trust that adult enough to let them help right away. So in those two different scenarios, the environments that those two children are living in and the experiences that they're having are shaping this pruning process in a way that, again, likely sets that first child up to do reasonably well and likely sets the second child up to struggle in the absence of getting any sort of remedial support. So that pruning process is enormously um, important because it is experience dependent. <clears throat> so what are the most critical experiences that we need to have during development? Well, it's true that learning some kind of behavior or skill earlier in development, such as a musical instrument or a second language, uh, it does tend to be easier when you uh, learn that earlier in life um, versus later in life. But it turns out that those kinds of enriched experiences are not actually critical to our development. Nobody ends up struggling later on because they didn't learn a second language when they were four, right? Um, but it does turn out that research has shown that there is one experience which is critical to development because if it's absent in the developmental period, you can see deficits across multiple functional domains. And that experience is a social one. So I want you to think very broadly about what it means to have a social interaction. We often describe these interactions as being kind of like a serve and return that goes on between a child and a responsive adult. And what it looks like is the child serves up some kind of activity, some sort of signal that they want to interact, and the adult needs to return that in a developmentally appropriate way, and in a way that keeps the interaction going back and forth for a period of time. And the purpose of these serve and return style interactions, particularly in the early developmental period, but keep in mind that this applies throughout that developmental period, which is into our mid to our late twenties. But what it does is it gives children the opportunity to practice, practice, practice really basic skills and behaviors and strengthen neural circuits in the brain. And so serve and return is gonna look a little bit different depending on the age and stage of the child. What might it look like when a child is pre-verbal? Well, it could look like gazing into the eyes of a newborn infant. You ever notice that they will gaze at your face? They are fascinated by the features of the human face. And in fact, we're, we're pretty much born hardwired for those social interactions. We do find, even as four-day-old infants, the human face highly engaging, and we'll stare at the human face over, you know, uh, and, and show preference for that over other types of objects or other types of patterns. We know that we will mimic facial expressions of the big people around us. It is a way of engaging those big people, because what can human infants do when they are first born? Not a whole lot, right? They can cry, they can poop, um, they can eat if somebody feeds them, but they can't do it alone, right? They can't flee from danger. So in fact, it's important for our survival to be able to engage these big people around us socially, such that um, some sort of danger pops up from behind a tree. Hopefully someone will pick us up and take us away uh, from the danger, right? So it's good for our survival, but it also builds the developing neural circuitry in the brain. And so again, that serve and return interaction is really important in terms of thinking about um, learning to speak. Um, so what happens when babies are young? They make noise, we make noise, right? That's a serve and return interaction. Um, they start to babble, we babble, or maybe say some basic words. 
What we are doing is encouraging them to keep practicing. And what does that do when we babble back or say words back? It ramps up their enthusiasm, their, their enthusiasm for making noise. Because hey, guess what? The big person thinks what I'm doing is cool. Um, so I'm going to do it again and again and again. It strengthens language circuits in the brain. And you know, even something as simple as um, you know having a preverbal infant um, pay attention to something that's out of their reach. That's a serve. Um, hey, I'm I'm interested in this thing. What is that? I don't know. It's, it looks kind of cool. I might like to interact with it. We need to recognize that they want to do something, and what do we do? We bring it over and we put it in front of their face, right? Um, and they do. They interact with it. Oh, yeah. They shove it in their mouth and they try and you know clutch it and everything else. And then what happens? They turn away. Um, but what do we do? We often whip it back in front of their face. Ah, oh, and they rediscover it again. And you know, they do that a few times until, yeah, I don't want to see that thing anymore. But that is a serve and return interaction that is helping that very, very young infant practice focusing their attention on what is making them in space. Attention is an executive function skill, very complex skill set, right? But really, really important. It's coming online really early. And as we get even older, these serve and return style interactions help us practice more and more sophisticated skills. So for example, um, you know, one of the big things that I think happens with a lot of tweens is uh, trying to plan out whether or not they're going to take math in high school. That was the big thing when I was, you know, going into high school. Oh, I don't wanna, I'm never going to use math, you know. And, and you know, you had to have that conversation with your tween to get them to think about, wait a minute now, what do you actually want to do four or five years from now, do you want to go to university? Do you not want to go to university? Does your program require math? You, know, you have to think about that. Long-term planning is something that we don't do well as kids. We need adult support to figure out how to create those long-term plans. See the goal, walk backwards, and what you need to fulfill that goal. A certain return interaction could look like helping your teenager get through the first time they get dumped in a romantic relationship. We need to develop coping skills to deal with rejection. Hopefully, we're not going to need them all the time, but you know, we all need um, to learn that skill set. It's important for us. All of those are serve and return style um, social interactions, which build skills. But in those very, very early years, again, um, those cognitive, social, and emotional skills, the really basic ones um, that we're developing, all work together to form the foundation for another skill set. Um, which I promised you I would come back to. That's executive function. So executive function is a big buzzword. I think you guys have all heard of it. Um, but I do want to emphasize that it's not a unitary phenomenon. It's not just one thing. It is a whole set of skills which work together to allow us to navigate through complex physical, social, and emotional environments. And so we often like an executive function to be something like a air traffic control system Brain. So if you think about what goes on at a busy airport and what the tra uh, air traffic controllers have to do, well, they're sitting up in their tower, and what do they have to do? They have to pay attention to all sorts of banks of radar screens all at the same time, right? Make sure that all those blips are staying separated from each other. They have to remember long lists of rules, protocols for different types of environmental conditions. If you have uh, fog and, uh, you know, rain, mist, and you've got these five planes coming in from different directions, what is the protocol you use to prioritize landing? Or if you have probably what's more likely here, gusty winds at you know 100 kilometers an hour, um, and this many planes from this many directions, what is your protocol for ordering and uh, prioritizing landing? You have to be able to ship when the information changes. You have to be able to ship on the fly. Oh my God, a new blip has just appeared on the screen that nobody was anticipating. It's a new flight coming in from Winnipeg, and now we have to potentially rejig everyone's landing pattern because that plane needs to land before it runs out of fuel. And you have to be able to do all of this, by the way, while understanding what's going on for you emotionally, controlling it, and ensuring that it's appropriate for the situation at hand. That's self-regulation. So all of those skills work together um, to provide us with the capacity to navigate in those complex environments. And if you want to sort of think about four really cardinal skills, I've given you a list up here, um, but four really cardinal skills and what they do for us. Um, so think about these four as being you know, really critical to good executive function. The first is working memory. 
or the ability to hold information in our mind and manipulate it over the short term. It is a key skill set involved in following lots of rules. And by the way, little kids can't follow lots of rules when they're really young. So what do we do? We start them off with really simple things. You know, we ask them to remember and execute one thing. Please go and place this on the table. You know, and once they get good at doing that, we might increase that to a two-step rule. And then once they get good at doing that, a three-step rule. Eventually, hopefully, they're going to get really good at remembering all sorts of rules. But I know that this is um, a healthcare setting. Think about that skill set as being really important and critical in terms of patients being able to remember and follow, it, follow instructions for taking their medications. Um, how many people can potentially struggle with that, right? Um, so we do know that working memory is a really, really key executive function skill set. Delayed gratification, sometimes also called an inventory control, is another really, really important skill set involved in long-term goal-directed behavior. So the child who is able to come home and do their homework first before going into the basement and playing whatever Halo World of Warcraft thing that they do nowadays, um, that is a child with good delayed gratification or inventory control. The ability to delay your desire to do something you would really like to do in favor of doing something that will potentially get you closer to a goal, but is far less desirable. Cognitive flexibility um, is the next one. That is the ability to shift when the information changes. It is a key skill set involved in problem solving and mental flexibility. So do, do, does, it, does anyone here know of any potential clients or patients who they work with who sometimes seem to persist um, along the same path um, when they've got a particular problem to solve, they can't seem to deviate from that path, you know? So you have to help them problem solve, find solutions, and help get them back onto a different track. Well, that inability to shift when the information changes, you know, I'm going on this path, I'm getting this same solution all the time that's not the one that I want, I need to shift in order to do something different, um, is a, a, a key role for cognitive flexibility. So really important in problem solving. And the last one is, again, self-regulation. So that ability to understand what's going on for us emotionally, controlling it, and ensuring that it's appropriate for the situation at hand. Um, very important skill set as well. Now, the reason why executive function is such a critical skill set is because it predicts three main outcomes for us. So first off, it predicts academic success. So this is not the difference between graduating with a 95% um, and going on to, you know, whatever university of your choice is. This is the difference between graduating at all versus dropping out or flunking out. And this is some work from Jim Heckman, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist. What he did was he analyzed very, very large data sets from the U.S. education system looking for predictors of high school graduation. And, of course, everyone thought it would be obvious whether or not you can get a 95 versus, you know, a 50. But it turns out that's not what he found. The best predictors were what he called soft skills. So the ability to get along with your teacher, get along with the other students in class, and complete your assignments on time and as asked, regardless of your grade, and show up for class on a regular basis, right? You know that when your bum is in the seat, you are much more likely to graduate than when it's not. And those are all executive function skills. So really, really important skill set for that. The next thing that it, it, it uh, predicts for us is employment success. So presumably everyone here is gainfully employed. Think about what your employer requests of you on a regular basis. They ask you to show up for work on time and on a regular basis, right? They ask you to please get along with your coworkers, please get along with your boss, um, please get along with your patients and your clients. Um, they want you potentially to be able to be a creative problem solver, right? It's an executive function skill. Um, they want you to be able to not spend six and a half hours of your seven and a half hour workday on Facebook. They want you to actually be doing your work. And they want you to be able to do all of this while controlling what's going on for you emotionally and ensuring that it's appropriate for the situation at hand, right? Those are all executive function skills. But the last outcome that executive function is important for is, I think, one of the most important outcomes um, for us as a species, and that is successful parenting of the next generation. So I don't know how many of you in this room are parents, but if you're not, think about what you would need to do 
in order to successfully parent a child or more than one child. You have to be able to juggle multiple priorities, right? You have to be able to remember long lists of rules, um, things that your kids have to be able to do or something that the school sends home or, or something like that. You have to be able to put their needs ahead of your own. Um, you have to be able to solve problems on a regular basis, right? Um, and you have to be able to do all of this while hopefully controlling what's going on for you emotionally and ensuring that it's appropriate for the situation at hand, particularly when you're trying to help your kids control their own emotions. It doesn't help when you get upset just because your child is upset. So all of those are executive functioning skills and they're really, really critical for that successful parenting of the next generation. And the reason why I think executive function is such a, um, an important skill set to think about um, when we think about building resilience is because it is located again in this area here, the prefrontal cortex behind the forehead and the eyes. It's the last area of the brain to develop, but it does begin coming online early in life. It means that we have a very, very long window of time in which this particular skill set is highly sensitive to experiences. Doesn't mean we can't build skills and abilities outside the developmental period, but within that developmental period, that circuit is going to be much, much more sensitive to experiences, and we can shore up skill sets if we need to. So there's one last way that those social interactions get under our skins, and it's through expression of our genes. So this is the process of epigenetics, the process of turning genes on and off. And we've known about this process um, for many, many decades. But people used to think that it was essentially complete by the time we were born. So it's, it was really viewed as the process in which we could allow some genes and cells to be expressed and other genes to be silenced so that we could control for different cell types as um, the embryo and the fetus were developing. Um, so of course you guys know that you know, every cell in our bodies has a copy of every single one of the roughly 23,000 genes that we have. Um, and when different cells are differentiated, some of those genes will get suppressed or turned off. And an epigenetic change is really that sort of change. And it's essentially a masking change. So we can put um, sort of uh, different types of proteins um, or change the configuration of DNA nucleus in ways that will hide genes from the cellular machinery that tries to turn them on. And that's really what an epigenetic process is, is again all about. We've known about it for many years, but some new research from the early 90s showed that postnatal experiences also influence gene expression in key ways. And it's the social nature of many of these experiences which, exerting that, which is exerting that influence. This is also some Canadian work. It's from McGill University. And they had a really nice natural experiment. Um, and so this natural experiment was that they had this big breeding colony uh, you know, of rats, um, and somebody happened to notice that there were two qualitatively different, not experimentally induced, but just qualitatively different types of rat mums in the colony. Um, they had what they ended up calling the super mums, um, who lick and groom their pups a lot. That's the way a rat mum shows her love to her pups. Um, she lick and grooms, she licks and grooms them when they scurry out of the nest, she goes and retrieves them right away, and she spends lots of time in close physical contact, uh, contact with then they had another group of rat mothers on the other end of the spectrum who were not bad mums, they were not neglectful. All of their pups thrived and survived into adulthood, but they were measurably different in the amount of care. The amount of close contact they spent with those pups, the numbers of times that they would lick and groom and retrieve them if they scurried out of the nest. They had a whole bunch of mums in the middle, by the way, which they didn't study. They just looked at these two extremes. And by the way, for all the men in the room and for any of the men out there listening, um, we have repeated these experiments in species which show paternal care. Um, so it's not about the gender of the person providing the care, it's about the quality of the care. Just so happens that rats do not show paternal care. If you put a rat dad into a cage with pups, he'll sit on them. I don't know if any of you have ever done rat research, but you know, they, they completely ignore them, right? So you can't test it. Um, but what they had was this really nice natural experiment. So they allowed these rat pups to um, grow um, and develop into adulthood, and they tested them on a whole number of mazes. And what they found was the rats from the poor quality care conditions were much, much more sensitive to challenging and stressful situations from rats from the high quality care conditions. And they measured this by looking at the level of cortisol, a stress hormone, in the bloodstream of the rats. Um, and again, found that 
stressful and challenging situations, elevated cortisol levels to a much greater extent in rats from a low quality care condition. And these cortisol levels did not come back to baseline nearly as quickly in the rats from a high quality care condition. Now, thankfully, one of the guys down the hall happened to be a geneticist. And he said, why don't we look at the epigenome and see if, you know, see if there are any genetic changes here? And they did, and it turns out they found a methyl group sitting right on top of one of the genes involved in the stress response system, uh, the gene that codes for the cortisol receptor in the brain, which essentially, from a physiological perspective, ended up silencing essentially that gene, producing fewer cortisol receptors in the brain, um, which ended up meaning that the stress response from a functional perspective uh, perspective was um, uh, uh, potentiated. So much, much greater cortisol release and um, much, much longer time in bringing those stress hormones back to normal. Um, so it was really that epigenetic change. Now what we think is going on here is um, a, a way in which our biology is helping to set us up to do well in the environments that we're born into. So if you imagine a rat as a social species, very much like humans. They live together in groups, they live in families, and they rely on each other for support. Um, support in times of uh, challenge, support in finding food, etc. If you're actually that rat pup getting a signal early in development that you actually don't have a lot of adult support, which is what we think is going on, not as much close contact with the adults in your life, might actually be adaptive for you to become a little bit more vigilant in threatening situations, a little bit more reactive to some of the challenges that you face. Because guess what? No one's got your back. And so we think that that's what's going on. Those um, epigenetic changes which are occurring early in development are occurring to allow us to do well in the environments that we're born into. But if you consider human beings as a species, yes, we're a social species as well, these exact same changes go on in humans as they do in rats. But humans actually live quite a bit longer than the rat does, right? We live for many, many decades. We rarely end up in the environments that we're born into. So the difficulty comes when there is a mismatch between the environment that we're born into and the environment that we end up in. So if we end up in an environment, we are born into an environment of low support, we end up in an environment of high support Suddenly, our stress response system is making us reactive because of that epigenetic change. We no longer react like all of the other people who might have grown up in those high support environments. It becomes more challenging for us to create those sort of social bonds because we have a reactive stress response system. Um, we might overreact in many ways, um, which might um, also produce difficulty in um, you know, maintaining close ties with our social groups. So in that way, those changes become maladaptive when there's a mismatch. And it turns out that these changes, once they occur, they do tend to be permanent. Um, so once those, um, those methyl groups or other sorts of changes which occur um, in DNA, they tend to be permanent. Um, they don't tend to revert back, although new research right now is still experimental in the animal phase. Um, we are looking to see if we can make some changes some of those um, epigenetic mechanisms, um, but it's early days in that. But not only do they tend to be permanent, they are potentially heritable. We can pass them on to the next generation. And this is, I think, really the biological basis for what people have called intergenerational trauma. So intergenerational trauma is not just about growing up in environments which continue to be dysfunctional um, because parents have not learned the skills that they need to be able to provide the, the, the appropriate environments for their children. There's also a genetic mechanism whereby we can pass down vulnerability to our children regardless of the environment that they grow up in. And a genetic change in our stress response system, as you can probably imagine, makes us vulnerable to a whole host of different types of problems which are um, associated with a heightened stress response. Okay, so, I want to cover now the biology of early adversity, um, and that's really about the role of stress in development. So stress also plays a role in brain development, but not all stress is the same. And it's important to understand that some stress is actually healthy for development. 
So we usually break it down into three different types of stress. And the first we call positive stress. So this is a brief activation of the stress response system. Stress hormones go up, they come back to baseline pretty quickly. And what this does is it gives kids the opportunity um, to have some small developmentally appropriate challenges that will help them practice coping skills. Because coping skills are governed by neural circuits like any other skill set that we have. They need to be practiced on a regular basis in order to make sure that those circuits are nice and strong and foundational, particularly as we learn more sophisticated coping skills as we grow and mature. The second kind of stress is called tolerable stress. So this is a more serious activation of the stress response system. Um, but the key defining factor with tolerable stress is that a child has access to a caring, supportive, stable adult who acts like an external stress response system for the child. So they help the child buffer their response to the stress. In the absence of that adult support, this type of experience would overwhelm the child. But if they are supported, no lasting damage um, to our biology is going to be found. Because again, that adult acts like an external stress response system. What do they do? They help the child calm down, right? Much, much faster than they would normally. So those stress hormones come down. Um, they potentially help the child practice their coping skills, or they teach that child more sophisticated coping skills over time. So tolerable stress um, typically does not cause um, any kind of permanent damage. But the last kind of stress is the bad guy. And it's what we call toxic stress. So toxic stress is a prolonged activation of the stress response system. And the key here is in the absence of adequate adult support. So the child does not have enough adult support to buffer their response to the stress. And so stress hormones get high, they stay high. Um, and it's those stress hormones circulating through our bodies and through our brains, which eventually damage both peripheral and central systems over time. And so the kinds of things that we often think of as cause of toxic stress are things like child maltreatment, uh, different forms of abuse, family dysfunction, but these are not the only things that can cause toxic stress for a child. They're simply the best study out there. Okay, so how does toxic stress get under our skin? Well, I know I have a healthcare audience here, so I'm not gonna go into a whole host of detail about what the stress response does for us, but it's important to remember that this stress response system is evolutionarily conserved, um, which means that every mammal has a stress response system that looks like the one on the slide, which is the human stress response system. And that stress response system has evolved over hundreds of millions of years to do one thing really well, which is help us deal with short-term threats and primarily threats from predators, right? So that is what this system was designed to do. It does not always deal as well with kind of long-term chronic threats that we now face as a species on a regular basis. But the stress response system also begins and ends in the brain. So when we um, perceive a threat in the environment, a little nucleus here in the midbrain, the hypothalamus, will kickstart um, a series of um, signals which will end up dumping stress hormones in the periphery. And the two major human stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol, will then jack us up, get all of our peripheral systems working um, to do essentially one of two things, which is fight or flee, right? It's that fight or flight response. Our blood pressure goes up, our heart starts to race, um, you know, our, our metabolism goes down, we start to preferentially store fat if we need to have um, energy for a long-term uh, fight or, or fleeing scenario. Um, you know, cortisol also acts in ways to both activate and suppress different parts of our immune system. Um, the immune system is an energy hog, so if we can actually suppress some of our innate required immunity, that's a good thing for us. It's a trade-off. You know, we'll get a cold three days from now as long as we can, you know, have all the energy we need today to get away from the predator. Um, but it also, it turns out, activates inflammatory pathways. And these inflammatory pathways are really, really important in killing off invading bacteria and speeding wound healing. So again, important if you're fleeing from a bear, right? And if you get mauled by that bear, that's gonna help you out. But when those inflammatory um, cytokines are circulating in our periphery without any sort of logical target, because we didn't actually get mauled by anything, we have no open wounds, we have no bacteria invading us, that can cause a problem. Um, and then of course the last role 
role um, of those hormones, uh, particularly of cortisol, is to cross back into the brain and shut down the stress response and the threat response. So there are three kind of main ways that toxic stress gets under our skin and affects our biology. The first is on that through that wear and tear on those peripheral systems and that sort of low grade inflammation which can occur when we've got chronic stress happening. That sort of damage to our cardiovascular system, our metabolic system, um, our immune system tends to accumulate over time and does not get repaired. So over decades, that can actually end up making us vulnerable to diseases of those systems over time. The next two ways though involve the effects of cortisol on the brain. So cortisol has a number of receptive fields in the brain and I'm only gonna talk about two. The first one is here in the prefrontal cortex um, the area behind the forehead and the eye. Now, why would cortisol interact with that particular area? Well, it turns out what it's doing is during that fight or flight response, cortisol is interacting with that circuit to dampen down our executive function systems and allow us to revert to more reactive behavioral repertoires, right? We do not want to be, there's a bear rushing into this room, getting out a piece of paper and doing this and writing pro, con, and thinking about what the heck should do for about five or ten minutes. No, we need the bear's lunch, right? So we have to be able to make those snap decisions and that's what cortisol is doing for us by interacting with that circuit. But when that circuit is developing, you're trying to actually use it on a regular basis, maybe in the classroom, um, and give it exercise. If cortisol is interacting with it and preventing you from doing so, you can potentially have long-term impacts on your ability to create good executive functioning skills because you're inhibited in your ability to use that circuit. And the last um, place that cortisol exerts its effects that I'll talk about is through its ability to shut down that stress response system. Again, cortisol, when it um, bombards that circuit, it sends a signal to, um, to fire to other cells in that circuit. Um, that eventually will deprive the cells of energy if it's occurring all of the time. And once a brain cell is deprived of energy, it gets sick and it potentially dies. Now it turns out though that our brain cells, unlike our peripheral cells, are plastic. That's a signal in development that they can use to change um, and adapt to that new, that sort of new normal, that constant cortisol signal. What do they do? They remove their connections from the circuit and that's a self-preservation mechanism for them, but it inhibits their ability to send signals saying shut down the cortisol response. And so what we see over time is for children who've experienced a lot of that toxic stress, what you can see is higher baseline circulating levels of cortisol over the course of the day. You can see this in adults who as children experienced a lot of toxic stress as well. And so what, you know, who are these types of people? They are people who are going to be a little bit hypervigilant, a little bit reactive, maybe a little bit aggressive, when faced with a challenge, irritable, right? These are people whose stress response system is essentially always on. Um, so we do know that it's um, uh, a bit of a vicious cycle. The more toxic stress that you experience, the higher those cortisol levels are in that developmental period, the harder cortisol is gonna try and shut down the stress response, and the more damage you're going to create to the circuitry that controls that stress response system you're gonna get less efficient at shutting it off. Okay, so a couple long-term outcomes associated with early adversity. I don't have time to go into some of the short-term outcomes, but I think you can probably see that these types of um, scenarios, these types of, of, of ways that toxic stress affects our biology would affect a child's ability to learn. It can affect our ability to process and understand emotions in the adults around us. It can affect um, whether or not we ever get picked up by the juvenile justice system, um, et cetera. But what I want to concentrate now are some of the much, much longer term outcomes. So this is some data from the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which is the largest study of its kind. It's a study of over 17,000 middle class, middle aged Americans, uh, mostly Caucasian, highly educated, um, employed, um, all with health insurance. It was a partnership between an HMO in California, Kaiser Permanente, and the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. And what they did was they asked these 17,000 people when they came in for their periodic health exam, a 10 item questionnaire. Before the age of 18, did you ever experience five types of childhood maltreatment and five types of family dysfunction? 
So they were physical neglect, emotional neglect, physical abuse, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse. Um, did you witness domestic violence? Um, was anyone in your household a substance abuser? Um, did anyone have an untreated mental illness? Um, did anyone uh, in your family, was anyone in your family ever incarcerated? And um, did you ever lose a parent for any reason, including divorce? And if you answered yes, you got a one. And if you answered no, you got a zero. And they added up your score out of 10 and they called it the ACE score, or the Adverse Childhood Experiences score. And then because it was an HMO that they were working with, the health records, and they just started matching up health records. So I want to show you a couple of slides from the study. You've got ACE score along the bottom, prevalence rates along the side. This is the rate of um, substance misuse by ACE score. What you can see is this dose response relationship between adverse childhood experiences and whether or not someone will have a substance misuse problem later on in life. Keep in mind, this is one of the questions they asked in that genetic questionnaire. Was anyone in your home a substance abuser, right? So we know that there are different types of ways that these problems get passed down from generation to generation. Is there a genetic load? Yes, there is, um, to a certain extent. Genes can make us vulnerable to substance misuse problems, other types of mental health issues. We also know that children will learn that if this is the way mommy handles her stress, maybe this is a good way that, you know, I should handle my stress. But we also know that people who have a lot of toxic stress in childhood are likely going to have hyperreactive stress response systems. They're not going to problem solve very well themselves. That also makes them vulnerable to these types of issues later on because they can use substances as, in many ways, solutions to problems, solutions to that high stress level. Um, which then, of course, become problematic as they continue to pursue. So this is the risk of developing major depressive disorder in adulthood. Again, you see that close um, dose response relationship. Um, this is the risk of a number of other uh, public health problems. Um, smoking status, obesity, attempted suicide, um, ever had an STI. All of those things go up with adverse childhood uh, experience exposure. Um, and all of them, in many ways, have to do with that, you know, hyper-responsive stress system. How are people treating that problem? They're doing all sorts of things to treat that problem, which gets them into trouble later on in life. And finally, the risk for adult heart disease. Again, you see that dose response relationship. That goes back to that wear and tear problem, right? Now, it turns out you can cross a heart disease and replace it with almost any other kind of chronic disease that you can think of. Any type of pain disorder, um, any type of autoimmune disorder, um, uh, allergies, uh, respiratory conditions, metabolic conditions, certain types of cancers, all of these things are related to adverse childhood experiences. And as the adverse childhood experiences score goes up, the risk level goes up as well. But what I do want to say is that this is not a guarantee of poor outcomes, okay? So this increases your vulnerability to poor outcomes, but it does not guarantee that you will end up with poor outcomes over time. We know that lots of people who have high ACE scores also end up doing very, very well. So what makes the difference between people who end up vulnerable and people who don't? And so this is now where I wanna wrap up with um, a discussion of resilience. So we used to think about resilience as being a special trait of very lucky people. And that's because of the way resilience research was done for a number of decades. What we did was we looked at groups of people who we decided were resilient, who had good outcomes, and then groups of people who we decided had poor outcomes. And we looked for the differences between the two, right? And we decided that, oh yeah, there's this magic box of traits um, that resilient people have that, oh, I guess these guys over here didn't have. Um, and so it was really kind of like a lottery system. You either got lucky or you didn't. And it didn't allow anyone to really understand how you can build resilience. And so that's really how resilience research has changed over the past decade or so. People don't look at it as a trait anymore. They look at it as a state, an outcome, as well as a process of skill building and capacity building over time. So if you think about resilience as an outcome, you can think about it kind of like a scale like I've got here. Um, where a resilient outcome would be having that scale tip in the positive direction, regardless of whether or not there's negative weight on the other arm. 
And in order to get that scale to tip positive, that's where we can think about resilience as a, a capacity or a skill set that can be built over time. What do we need to do? We want to load up the positive arm with all of those nurturing, supportive interactions that we know that kids need. That's going to help build skills and capacities in the brain. We want to try and prevent as much as possible the negative arm from loading up with experiences. Um, and when it does have negative experiences on it, we want to buffer that. Again, how? Supportive adult relationships. Buffer, buffer, buffer um, that, um, that negative experience. But the other key part about how easy it is to tip this scale from side to side is the fulcrum here. It's positioned in the middle in this particular diagram. But you can think about that fulcrum, that tipping point, as being like our innate capacity for resilience. So what we're born with, okay? And it starts in a different place for each child. We all know some kids who start with the fulcrum in a position that makes that scale so easy to tip positive, even when they've got negative challenges on the other side, right? Kids who seem to do well, even when they've got a lot of, you know, things going on in their life. And we also all know kids who have the fulcrum over into the other area of that scale, where that scale ends up being really, really easy to tip negative. One little thing and this kid bottoms out, right? And you think, why is it that this kid isn't doing well, this kid has the exact same experience and seems to be fine? So that fulcrum is our, like our natural innate capacity for resilience. But keep in mind that our innate capacities, our innate biology, is very, very sensitive to experiences. We can shift the fulcrum for anyone through supportive um, adult relationships, which are going to, again, build those skills and capacities over time. So, and this is my last slide. Um, for anyone in this room who is over the age of 30, um, I do want to assure you that it's never too late to make change in terms of the skills and abilities um, in our brain. What changes, though, is that the amount of time, resources, and effort to make change increase. So this blue line here is the plasticity curve, the brain's ability to change in response to experiences, and it never goes to zero. But what does happen is, again, the amount of effort required goes up. So it's easier, faster, and cheaper to get it right the first time. We want to intervene early if we possibly can. But for those of you who work with adult populations, change is still possible. Um, and we create that change in exactly the same way that we would for kids. We give people the opportunity to practice, practice, practice skills and abilities in the context of supportive adult relationships. All right, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Sorry, I went to a long couple minutes. But So, um, oh, very loud now, okay. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was really um, great to understand what, um, you know, the explanation from the scientific, you know, research and, and how that really impacts uh, individuals. Um, um, my name is Valerie, I'm from First Nations Community Health Service. I'm the lead for the program here at St. Paul's in RUH. And um, uh, we work with our First Nations Métis families and communities throughout the province that come into the health system here. And uh, just looking at this, you know, I really relate to how so many First Nations Métis, we struggle through many mental health and addictions, we struggle through many chronic diseases, diabetes, you know, you talked about 
hard for me to connect the pieces and to see why so many people are suffering the way they do. You know, mental health and addiction, 60 to 70 percent are First Nations. Child apprehension, we have our own uh, child welfare system just for First Nations people, you know, living on this earth. Like, what, what does that say? You know, that, that's huge for the amount of struggles that our people are facing. In Saskatoon, we serve over 40 percent of the North, majority are First Nations and Métis. So we, we tell people, you know, the majority are um, First Nations and Métis that get told, you're, you're going against medical advice. They get sent out the back onto the street, even if they're homeless, right? Some of the resources are not in place that, that we don't have or we don't understand. So this really connected all of that for me to be able to better advocate. So uh, part of this presentation was through the St. Paul's Mission Office, and we often talk about mission as how we talk about who we are and that we want to be a caring people, that mission is St. Paul's, and that ethics is really putting that into practice. How does our behavior change when we know uh, who we are? And so when I, when I look at this presentation, I'm always thinking about what next? What does this mean for our behavior as a community that wants to be caring and help, help people who have gone through these adverse childhood experiences? So um, from your perspective and in the work that you do, what are maybe, I don't know, two or three of the things that you wish could change through policy or hospitals or through community groups coming together? Um, if you had an inspirational glow and get her done kind of <laughs> speech, what would be things that would be top of your list? Well, I think that this information, um, so I've, I've heard it and I've also seen it in action to a certain extent, um, how it can remove the stigma um, from addiction problems, from mental health problems. Um, and I think that that would go a long way towards um, creating uh, more trauma-informed systems. Um, so, you know, so the, the woman who was just speaking, to, you know, talked about people who are getting released out into the street. I know through my volunteer work um, with uh, Alpha House, uh, we serve uh, over 50% um, of our clientele are Indigenous. Um, and, um, you know, we have, have just managed to, over the past few years, um, get support for harm reduction housing in Alberta. Well, you know, harm reduction used to be a, a kind of a not, um, you know, not a, red, not a good word in Alberta uh, with some of the conservative viewpoint that was viewed as enabling, uh, even though we know that people um, really do struggle and having a safe place to live can actually give them that leg up that they need um, to start, you know, thinking a little bit differently, getting some of their um, health issues um, better managed. Um, so I think that this this knowledge base gives people a window onto that to rethink how they view people with addiction and mental health problems. Um, I think that um, making sure that all systems know this information um, is is really critical because you know our healthcare system is interacting with. Nonprofit system um, with um, you know EMS, which are you know a, a one step removed. But then policing, you know, how does that factor in when we think about people who are street involved? Um, but but even for folks who are not street involved, um, you know, when you go to your family doctor with a problem, um, and that family doctor has a particular understanding of what your issue is, which is not consistent with with what we know about science. You can get advice which is not necessarily the best advice. I mean, how do we treat um, obesity right now? We treat obesity in the medical system in the same way that we used to treat smoking. Stop doing that. You know. Well, you know, how does that how does that work for anyone? You know, to tell people that they're going to have uh, you know diabetes or other kinds of metabolic problems, a certain types of cancer down the road does not necessarily assist anyone if they're struggling with. Um, overeating, right? They might be um, doing that from a perspective of well, that might be the thing that actually helps them cope with their stress, um, helps them cope with the challenges that they have in their lives. So rethinking some of those behaviors as being um, solutions to problems and treating them that way um, might actually, I think, go a long way. And, and then I guess lastly what I would say is, again, getting all systems focused on the need to 
um, to use this information in key ways because uh, I realize that this is a healthcare audience, but the healthcare system cannot be um, in many ways the garbage can for all of these predictable problems coming down the pipe. If we can't do prevention, um, and, and we, by the way, we don't have enough children's mental health services um, to provide mental health care for everyone. So what we need to do is get in there before those mental health problems develop um, and actually need um, the kind of the tertiary support systems um, that we have in place, the hospital-based care, the outpatient care. Um, and we can do that by thinking about all people, all organizations, all systems and services that come in contact with kids and families as being able to build this capacity for resilience. So your babysitter, um, you know, your, your daycare worker, um, your preschool teacher, everyone in the school system, your pediatrician, your, you know, all of those people um, should be able to know what this means and know how to act on it. Um, and that, that's the only place, you know, where that's the only way we're really going to get in front of this huge burden on the healthcare system. I don't see any other hands in telehealth. Um, are there any other questions? Lots of follow-up questions. All right, well, we've gone over our time a little bit already, so I think uh, we'll maybe wrap up just by thanking uh, Nicole for coming. Um, thank 